For one thing, he started swearing he had an alibi before he knew what it was all about. Another thing, the watchman was shot twice from a distance, and one close to. And it was the close-up shot that wrecked the watch. You mean the watchman was killed first, and that the killer set the watch ahead, then shot him again so as to establish his alibi? That's exactly what I think happened. Try tell that to a jury. Yeah, it would be pretty hard to believe, unless you know more about crooks than most juries do. How could you prove a thing like that, Nick? I don't know, Patsy, but there must be some way. Well, if there is, Nick, you'll find it. Well, I hope so. I'm going to do my darndest, anyway. Well, let's go back to the museum. Maybe we overlook something there that'll give us the answer. Is there anything else you'd like to see, Mr. Carter? No, no, I think not, Mr. Steiner. I have gone over everything here in the vicinity of the murder with a fine-tooth comb. And you find nothing that helps establish the murderer's identity? No, nothing at all. No fingerprints on the case where the Van de Vries collection was. No marks of any kind anywhere. But you still feel sure that Danny Mearson is guilty? I'll stake my reputation on it. I've got to find some way to break down his alibi. Nick, could you try a lie detector on it? Oh, no. See, unfortunately, too many people still believe that a lie detector is only a makeshift and not real evidence. They do? They don't believe that a wiggly line running across a chart can mean anything definite. No, but we scientists know better than that. And take our seismograph, for example. From the wiggly line that the pen on the seismograph makes, we can tell... Seismograph? That... Yes. You have one here? In the museum? Why, yes, we do. Why? Where is it? We're in the next room here, just the other side of the Egyptian exhibit. Good. But why are you so interested in that? Dr. Steiner. That seismograph of yours is going to prove Mearson guilty of the murder. Well, Nick, we're all here, just as you wanted. What's up? Yes, Mr. Carter. I demand to know why my client, Mr. Mearson, has been brought here to Lieutenant Riley's office. Now, he's admitted being a receiver of stolen goods, but he's guilty of nothing else. All right, all right, Mr. Riley. Let's get right down to the facts. You say your client is guilty of nothing but receiving stolen goods. I do. And I protest Just against your... I'll do the talking now. <clears throat> you claim that Mearson could not have stolen the scarab and murdered the watchman because at the time the murder and theft were apparently committed, he was engaged in conversation with a policeman and a drug clerk some three miles from the museum. That's right. Absolutely right. And it's a terrible outrage Amberley... to... Did you notice that I used the word apparently when I spoke of the time the murder was committed? Well? I did that purposely. The watchman's timepiece was set ahead by Mearson to establish an alibi for himself. That's a lie. It ain't true. Oh, that's ridiculous. Not quite as ridiculous as you might think. The evidence I have here is unemotional, truthful, and positive. It's a seismographic chart. A what? What's that? Yeah, Nick, well, what in the name of the far science is a seismograph? A seism seismographic chart? Yeah. I'll tell you. In the room next to the Egyptian collection is a seismograph. Huh? It's an instrument used to detect earthquake tremors, and it's Ooh. so sensitive that it'll record even the slightest disturbance. I have here the chart that was made on the seismograph at the museum last night. Oh, all oh, this is most irregular. So is murder, Mr. Ramberley. Now notice. At 1245, there was a slight tremor, or trembling of the earth, due to some distant earthquake. Hmm. At 1.05, five minutes past one, there were two sharp eruptions in the immediate vicinity. The reason for them is not definitely determined, but they could have been caused either by nearby blasting or by the reports of a gun shot off in the next room. Huh? And there was no blasting done last night. Oh, get to the point, Carter. My time is valuable. Human life is valuable, too. The next thing this chart shows is that at 1.17, 17 minutes past one... Twelve minutes after the first two shots, there was another sharp report recorded. And from then on, until 15 minutes before six, the line is straight as a die. Which means simply that no shots were fired in the museum between 1.17 and 5.45 in the morning. Then that means that the watchman was shot and killed at five minutes past one. Danny turned his watch ahead and shot him again at 17 minutes past one, which gave him plenty of time to get to the drugstore and set up his alibi. Oh, Nick, that's wonderful. It's as good as a lie detector. But that doesn't prove that's that... That's why you, Samberley, they got me. But, but Danny... It all happened just like they said. Swiped the scar, but the old guy caught me as I came out of the room, so I had to bump him off. And I fixed the watch to give me an alibi. They got me licked with that... That, that 
Let's call it a truth machine, Danny, because that's what it really is. It tells the truth. And in this case, makes others tell the truth, too. A wonderful machine, Danny. A wonderful machine. In just a moment, Nick and Patsy will be back to tell you about next week's story. A story even more exciting than the museum tragedy. You know, the things you have in your home reflect your own good taste. So naturally, you want to keep them as lovely as you can. And Linux Cream Polish does just that for your fine furniture. Because it cleans as it polishes, one quick, easy application of Linux Cream Polish erases finger marks, removes dust and old polish deposits, helps conceal scratches, all at the same time. And it leaves a handsome, gleaming surface you'll be proud of. A surface free of oil to discourage dust. So save half the time, half the fuss of furniture upkeep the easy modern way. Make a habit of using Linux cream polish for fine furniture. It saves one whole step in your cleaning day routine. Get it at your dealers now. And don't forget that he also has Linux clear gloss, the long-lasting brush-on protection for all your floors, which flows on easily and dries overnight to a beautiful gloss finish that lasts for months. You'll find all three great Linux home brighteners at your nearest hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the modern wall finish in rich, glowing colors that lighten and brighten every room in your home. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. You know, Nick, science is wonderful, isn't it? Yes, Ken, you're right. And our story next week is further proof of that fact. How's that, Nick? It was a scientific explanation of why the wound in the dead man's body was made the way it was that gave me my first real clue to his murder. And when the dead man just walked into the office, sat down in a chair, and died without saying a word, well, you can see how badly we needed clues. What do you call the story, Nick? I call it short-range murder. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Choate as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The entire program was written and directed by Jock McGregor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners, Linux Clear Gloss Varnish, Linux Cream Polish, and Linux Self-Polishing Wax, created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paint. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This is Andrea J. Graham, author of the Web Surfer series. Oh, and a man's wife. You're listening to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Welcome back. A pretty solid episode, and I think told quite credibly. As a rule, you know, either you have a bad lawyer or the police have got you dead to right. When all your lawyer can do is tut-tut about this being highly irregular. Now, I should note that this does require some uh, change to our view of the Nick Carter series in terms of the airing order. Uh, Because I actually previously had another episode listed as airing May 27th, The Mystery of Hangman's Wood. However, uh, the research from the old-time radio researchers 
actually pushes the date for the previous episodes to this one back. Uh, the episode that I had on May 27th, The Haunted Rocking Chair, actually uh, aired May 20th. The Mystery of Hangman's Wood, which I had on May 20th, actually aired on May 13th. And The Vanishing Lady, which I had on May 6th, actually aired on April the 29th. So, some updated research allowing us some more space for episodes. Now, of course, all of those episodes listed off shows that uh, there were quite a few Nick Carter episodes in 1944 and 1945. So, heretofore, we've kind of bolstered the circulating episodes of Nick Carter with more episodes where we already had quite a few in circulation. But next week, we will actually bring you an episode of Nick Carter from a period where we actually didn't have any episodes at all in circulation. So I'll tell you all about that next week. Join us back here tomorrow for Rocky Jordan. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Uh, become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. And follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off. All right, so Matt, have you heard the joke about silence? No. Yeah, me either. <laughs> How apropos. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Everybody and welcome to the graveyard. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Adam. And my name's Matt. Now, pull up a tombstone or settle into your casket and get comfortable because this is Graveyard Tales. <laughs> All right, everybody, here we are again. Um, real quick, wanted to tell everybody, like we always do, go check out podbelly.com the podbelly network you can find a lot of shows that you might not have found otherwise and you can find a lot of information about starting your own podcast if you would like to do that it's a very helpful site go check them out podbelly.com now we have another see a live show coming up saturday march 7th it's 8 p.m to 9 30 p.m so we're hoping by a change in what day of the week and the time a little bit that more of y'all will be able to join. Yeah. So Saturday, March 7th, 8 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. and that's Central Standard Time. And we're going to go over all the shows that we've talked about since the last live show up until that point. So yeah. You ask, we deliver. You right. Want it on a different day? We did it. Want it at a later day, at a later time? We did it. So. Right. Yeah, you have no excuse to not join <laughs> right. us. <laughs> Don't ask crazy things because we might not be able to deliver on those. But yeah, uh, it's, we're Saturday, to it's get Saturday it. night. I'm and, and and we're talking about stuff we've already talked about. So I'm, I may I may have an adult beverage. Y'all, yeah, you, know, you might as well tune in. It may get a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> we've only got an hour and a half, man, so it can't get too crazy. <laughs> Um, so another live show that we've got coming up, this one will be in person live show is going to be July 18th in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Um, you can get tickets on our website. We're going to be doing it with Hillbilly Horror Stories. It's their show and they invited us along. So we, we said, heck yeah, we're going to be there. Yeah. And we can, uh, when we're done, we can all go play the uh, haunted mini golf. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> and I don't know if it'll be open, but I know in uh, Gatlinburg they're opening a new ride or something um, that just, should be open just by a then. Ride. Yeah, one of the That's rides right. that that they do in uh, downtown Gatlinburg. So oh. after you, after you uh, listen to us, you can go over there and check that out and make a weekend of it. Is it haunted? Is it a haunted ride? And give it a few years, and it might be. <laughs> it ain't no count. <laughs> I ain't getting on it. <laughs> All right, Matt. So we'll get out of this uh, housekeeping business here. And uh, why don't you tell us what we're talking about tonight, brother? Okay. So tonight we're talking about. Yeah, you guessed it. The zone <laughs> of silence. <laughs> 
the zone of silence in Mexico. And uh, I'm I'm gonna let uh, I'm gonna let Adam say it in Spanish because I will destroy it. Uh, Zona de Silencia. Hey, there you go. See, he's he's only been in Texas for about eight months, and he's <laughs> he's already can speak in Spanish like a native. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was born here. I should be able to. <laughs> you come to Tennessee and you lose all that. That's know? a valid point. I did lose a lot of it moving up there. But yeah, we're talking about this area that's. Right on the edge of uh, the state of Chihuahua. Um, well done. It it is a it is, I mean, essentially, it, it looks like a desert. I mean, and, and it, it's just this rough terrain. It's really not inhabitable, other than you know some ranchers and things like that. Um, but it it has some really strange anomalies that occur there. Um, with, you know, magnetic interference with radios and cell phones, and it's got UFOs, weird people, weird people. I mean, it, it's just a, a lot of weird stuff and nobody's really taking a look at it. And we're going to talk about it tonight and let you decide if anybody should be. Uh, there's a lot of folks that believe this is just a bunch of baloney there's a lot of people that think this is a you know a a geological anomaly that needs to be studied so you can tell us what you think so right so adam tell us a little bit about uh the zone of silence all right so like matt said we talk about a lot of weird anomalies around the world and if everything that's has been said about the Zona de Silencia is true, then this is probably one of the stranger ones that we've talked about. And it, it it's not far from Bolson de Mapimi in Mexico. Um, there's about a 50 kilometer area of desert that has been given this name, the Zone of Silence. Now it lies in the Trino Vertex, and this is where the Chihuahua, Durango, Cojilla states meet roughly 400 miles south of El Paso, Texas. Um, it's There's a big prominent mountain range that runs on the east side of this zone, so it kind of blocks it in a little bit. And on an interesting note, the zone of silence is near longitudinally parallel with the Egyptian pyramids on the Giza Plateau, the Bermuda Triangle, and sacred cities in Tibet, and it's located just north of the Tropic of Cancer between 25 degrees and 29 degrees north. So what does that sound like? That sounds like our last SIA show. That's right. Yeah, all these places are lined up. Now, it doesn't fall along that line that we discussed. Right. But that that area between the 26th and 28th parallel is... It, it, it's loaded with oddities, you know, ancient ruins, anomalies like the Zone of Silence and the Bermuda Triangle. So it, when anything falls in that area all the way around the globe, people kind of take notice of anything peculiar that happens there. Right. It's kinda, a lot like the know, 37th parallel. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean... But when you when you look at those kind of connections like we did uh, on our See You Live show, you begin to wonder why, you know, what, are are we making something out of nothing, or or is, is there a reason that these places would line up so well? I mean, right. you know, we're not going to dig into that. Um, we've already done that. <laughs> right. Um, but this is just another one of those places that's just, it's out of sorts, again, if if all the stories are true. Right. And why would a region of Mexican wasteland that is this remote fall along that thing and have such weird activity? Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, what, what, it, we'll, we'll maybe talk about this a little bit later, but I had to throw this in. If we were to do full-on excavation of this would we find another buried ruin of a city or inhabitation of that area that we don't know about yet but it could be 
a, an ancient civilization that was taking advantage of whatever oddities are happening in this yeah. zone. Yeah. Well, it like I said, it's very remote, and the closest urban settlement, Caballos, is about 25 miles away. Now, residents of the surrounding towns have been aware of these strange legends that go around in the zone for quite a while. Um, but some of the first rumors that purportedly began in the 1930s were after the pilot Francisco Sarabia once had to make an emergency landing due to, quote, radio anomalies. And we'll have a picture of Francisco at the next See Alive show if you want to see what he looks like. Now, Sarabia was airborne over the region when he began to notice that his instruments were acting oddly. Um, this wasn't the only problem, though, that he was facing because his radio equipment also started to fail and then just completely stopped working altogether. And he said it was something that was interfering with the normal operations of his aircraft. So that sounds a lot like what you hear with the Bermuda Triangle. Mm-hmm. And this has been called uh, uh, the Bermuda Triangle of Mexico before. Yeah. So it, it's pretty odd. And Matt, he's not the only pilot that had issues, was he? No. Um, there was a, an organic chemist named Harry de la Pena. And he, w- he documented the zone's characteristics of creating this dark zone, as he called it with radio communications back in 1966. Now, he was on a photographic survey, and while he was out exploring, he noticed that the walkie-talkies quit working in in that area, and he said the portable radios that they had would only work with a very diminished volume. You know, even when they turned it all the way up, they could barely hear it. Right. And... They later found out that television signals wouldn't go through the zone of silence. And even now, people will say that television doesn't work in the in the zone of silence. Of course, if you if you look at pictures of this place, you're like, man, cable hadn't gotten there yet. Yeah, right. (laughs) Right. I was going to say, which is, you know, not really odd when uh, when you think about how we get our TV now. (laughs) <laughs> Even with an antenna, you got to be close enough to a tower. And right. Who, who's going to put a TV tower out there, you know? Right. <laughs> out in this wasteland desert, you know? Yeah. Fox News is going to go out there and put, plant a tower in the middle of this place. <laughs> yeah, They're right. Like, hey, okay. <laughs> right. Uh, the first people that do will make a killing. Wait. No, they won't. There's nobody out there. <laughs> There's nobody there. Yeah. Um. So there's been a... A lot of weird things that have hit out of the sky in the zone of silence. And one of those was during the Cold War, the White Sands Missile Base in New Mexico um, had been conducting a series of tests using an Athena RTV, a re-entry test vehicle rocket. Um, Now, the missions were a joint task between the USAF and the U.S. Army, and they're designed to investigate the impacts of missiles as a result of re-entry into the atmosphere. So it was important work if we were going to go to space and come back, and mm-hmm. we needed to figure out how things were going to land. Yeah. Well, July 11th, 1970, the Athena RTV V123D rocket launched from Green River Complex in Utah. Now, the last stage of this rocket was carrying a capsule of radioactive cobalt-57, which, not a good plan anyway to be shooting off a rocket with radioactive cobalt. But they had a reason for that. Yeah. Um, It was supposed to drop in the deserts of White Sands, New Mexico. Well, the reason that they had the cobalt-57 on there is they wanted to see how much of the sample degraded upon reentry. You know, sure. so <laughs> my my thought is they're 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 not necessarily testing about coming back from space. They're testing about how much de- degrading a, a nuclear warhead would undergo 
yeah, while it's exactly. coming down. <laughs> exactly. So how much but, extra would we have to put in there yeah. for it to make it to its destination? Exactly. That, to me, that's what they were looking for. But that's why it was on there. There, there are some stories that say that it was a dirty bomb, and it wasn't a dirty bomb. I mean, it was a sample. If it was a dirty bomb, why the hell would they shoot it out in the middle of White Sands, New Mexico? Yeah, I mean, there's people out there. Right. You know, on their <laughs> own people. Hey, we're going right. to test this dirty bomb. You know, then I guess there's people going, oh, well, they weren't. That was a lie, and they were shooting it to Mexico to begin with. Again, why? Yeah. You know? If, um, if it was a successful test and they shot a dirty bomb in the middle of a desert with no people, what are they going to learn? So I don't, I don't believe any of that, but I, I do believe that it was, you know, let's see how much of this is going to, you know, how much do we have to load, you know, yep. to, to wipe out, you know, a city, you know, so, right. and, you know how much are we going to lose in the travel? Uh, mm -hmm. of this of this rocket when it re-enters the atmosphere but what was right. what was really funny to me is that this is not uncommon they had been doing this for a while launching you know out of utah into mexico it, it was like they were you know it was like target practice and i'm like mm -hmm. pretty much how how many people were these missiles flying over that, yeah that, that if it had failed yeah if something went wrong They'd have been like, oops. Yeah. Yeah. I, we don't know what happened. Yeah. Well, well speaking of failing, <laughs> this one, this rocket did develop a fault. But luckily for everybody that was under it, like Matt was saying, that it could have landed on, it actually overshot the destination by 500 miles. Yeah. So it ended up crashing into the zone of silence, um, which is about 500 miles south of the border. Um, so yeah, it, it did develop a fault. There was a problem, but you know, it was drawn to uh, what some theorists say it was drawn to the yeah, zone of silence. Pulled it there. Right. Which brings up another question. If a missile crashes in the desert and no one's around to hear it, does it really make a sound? I'm going to say yes. <laughs> I've interviewed a few coyotes that I haven't told you about. <laughs> And uh, they say, yes, it does. <laughs> yeah. And thanks yeah. to the radioactive uh, cobalt 50, their kids now have six legs. <laughs> Six-legged coyotes, a yeah. mystery of the zone of silence. Yeah. <laughs> I, bet they're, I bet they're fast. <laughs> oh, yeah. Th those, there are no roadrunners in that part of the Mexican <laughs> desert. <So. laughs> you know, on a tangent, I read a thing earlier this week that said uh, the actual land speed of like the Roadrunner and the Coyote, like co the Coyote would be eating these things left and right. There's no yeah. way this Roadrunner was able to outrun this Coyote. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, that's, well, they, that's they just funny. looked faster. They oh, looked yeah. faster. Well, so when you're, you know, big blue and purple bird that can spin his legs around like racing yeah. wheels. <laughs> right. Why not? Meet me. <laughs> All right, all right, all right. Change it up. Right, back to it. <laughs> so when the U.S. government actually requested permission to enter this area and retrieve the debris, the Mexican government actually said, yes, please get your crap out of our land. <laughs> uh, that's not our exactly ball, what they said. But, our ball you know. went over the fence. Is, yeah, exactly. Can we come in your yard and get it? <laughs> exactly. So the, the U.S. government quote, worked quickly and covertly to uh, secure uh, the area sure and begin all right, begin a search for their re radioactive capsule. Now, when the retrieval team entered the site, they supposedly real quickly realized that something was affecting all of their communications. And, you know, without these communications, they couldn't coordinate between the teams very well. So they were kind of getting lost in the Mexican desert there. Um, but they realized here, again, like Matt was saying, that television and satellite signals were experiencing mm -hmm. disruptions in that area. So, again, I mean, you're out in the middle of the desert with, you know, the closest city being like 25 miles away. So 
uh, television and satellite signals probably aren't going to be the best. Yeah, I can't imagine. Um, well, it took quite a few weeks, but the U.S. government found the capsule. So quickly, quickly was a few yeah, weeks. Quickly. Yeah. Um, 1970, they, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, they they were taking it as a vacation. Didn't have you know. a GPS tracker, but uh, yeah, 